your foot and ankle and gait with inversion and eversion being important for locking and unlocking the subtalar joint uh, or uh, locking and unlocking the midfoot. Bowler's angle is formed by a line drawn from the superior aspect of the anterior process of the calcaneus to the superior aspect of the posterior facet and a line intersects that from the tuberosity to the superior aspect of the posterior facet. A no normal angle is 25 to 40 degrees. And you see that with calcaneus fractures, when that posterior facet is displaced inferiorly, Bowler's angle becomes more acute uh, with that displacement. Calcaneal uh, dimensions, including height, width, and length, are also important. The height of the calcaneus is simply the superior to inferior distance of the bone. Now you can see on this x-ray of an injured calcaneus that the height is significantly decreased as the talus is driven inferiorly into the body of the calcaneus, displacing that posterior facet. The width of the calcaneus is simply the medial to lateral distance of the bone, and this is an axial projection of an uninjured calcaneus representing a normal width of the heel. You can also see on this image that the lateral wall is relatively flat and reduced, and the posterior facet can also be seen. And finally, the horizontal length of the calcaneus is important, and this can be evaluated on a sagittal projection uh, of the calcaneus. It's simply the anterior to posterior distance. Uh, you can see that with this calcaneus fracture, the calcaneus is significantly shortened. This is important biomechanically because by shortening the calcaneus, you're essentially shortening the lateral column which abducts the foot, uncovers the tailor head, and leads to lateral peritalar subluxation and uh, overstress of the posterior tibial tendon. Now delving into uh, fractures of the calcaneus a bit more, we'll first look at the mechanism of injury. These are axial loading injuries in which the calcaneus is driven down into the anatomic equivalent of the angle of Gassain, uh, leading to fractures that commonly present in this uh, area. These are called the primary fracture lines. Secondary fracture lines can also propagate uh, out into the anterior medial fragment of the calcaneus in a stellate uh, pattern. This primary fracture line represented in red divides the calcaneus uh, into two primary pieces, an anterior medial piece and a posterior lateral piece. It involves various aspects of that posterior facet. You also get comminution that extends posteriorly, and that's responsible for uh, either joint depression or tongue-type fractures that we commonly hear about. In the top right image, you can see a model representing a joint depression fracture. The primary fracture line is represented with that red line. The secondary uh, posterior fracture line exits in between the posterior facet and the tuberosity, separating these two anatomic structures. So that posterior facet is more or less a free piece and can be driven inferiorly. This is a sagittal CT scan representing a joint depression injury with the primary and secondary fracture lines being seen there and the posterior facet's been driven inferiorly. This contrasts to tongue type injuries which are seen on the lower right image in which that posterior fracture line exits uh, lower down on the uh, tuberosity of the calcaneus and the posterior facet and the tuberosity actually remain in continuity with one another as seen in this uh, sagittal image, primary and secondary fracture lines. As the uh, talus is driven down into the calcaneus, uh, various 
manifestations of this uh, energy and displacement occur, the first of which is uh, posterior facet comminution. You get varying levels of facet comminution based on the amount of energy that's transferred from the talus into the calcaneus. These are three axial uh, representations of varying degrees of posterior facet comminution. Subfibular impingement is, is an important concept and something to be evaluated uh, as the talus is driven down into the calcaneus, that lateral piece of calcaneus can be displaced into the inferior aspect of the fibula. Uh, in this case, it actually uh, fractured the fibula, but the perineal tendons are in that area. They can become pinched and injured, and if not reduced, patients then bear weight through this displaced lateral piece through their distal fibula, uh, which hurts as it's not intended for that. Um, heel widening. Uh, results from displacement of the calcaneus. You can see the green line here represents a relatively normal heel width, whereas the red shows that uh, the fractures have not been reduced. You've got subfibular impingement and a widened heel. A final concept that I'd like to discuss is the Taylor attitude and how the shape or how the position of the talus changes when the calcaneus is not appropriately reduced. The upper image here is a normal uh, foot whereas the lower image is a fracture that's uh, not been appropriately reduced. I'd like to point out that uh, Gassane's angle is greater than 145 degrees here, and the facets have not been reduced into their normal anatomic location. The bowler's angle is very acute, uh, less than 25 degrees. The posterior facet's been driven inferiorly into the body of the calcaneus, and the height has been lost. And then finally, as a result of these, the talus takes a more horizontal position relative to the normal foot. This leads to impingement between the talus and the distal tibia. It alters the biomechanics of the subtalar joint and the talonavicular joint. Now, in looking at management issues, we've been able to identify some factors that predict uh, how patients are going to do with these injuries. Certain factors for which patients do better are a younger age, simple fracture patterns with less comminution, having an initial bowler's angle between 0 and 14 degrees, obtaining and maintaining an accurate articular reduction, and maintaining subtalar motion. Uh, factors that predict worse outcomes can be divided into patient factors and anatomic factors. The patient factors are smoking, diabetes, and peripheral vascular disease. Anatomic factors include bilateral injuries, uh, open injuries, injuries that have significant comminution and loss of cartilage, and patients who become stiff or have significant edema after their injuries or their interventions. In 2002, uh, Dr. Beret and his colleagues, you guys will recognize most of these names, uh, described uh, treatment options for calcaneous fractures and said that virtually every aspect of management of complex calcaneal fractures is controversial. And over a decade later, I would say that that statement is still very true. There are three primary treatment options. Uh, those include closed management with or without a reduction, an extensile lateral approach, or a mini open approach. Salvage procedures would include a primary fusion, uh, but we'll be discussing these three today. When looking uh, first at the closed management techniques, this is based on the fact that patients are made non-weight bearing, they're splinted, and then they begin early range of motion. This has been uh, evaluated in the literature, and two-decade follow-up of 84 fractures showed that these patients get arthritis of their subtalar joint and their ankle joint 90 and 100 percent. So while it's cheaper, there are less soft tissue complications because you're not making any incision in the skin, we do see higher rates of arthritis in these patients. The extensile lateral approach allows you to get a perfect reduction of the articular facets, but you've got to be very mindful of these soft tissues so you don't get wound healing problems and deep infections. Uh, 47 cases were followed 10 years, and they found that 40% uh, of these cases actually had excellent results, and the reduction quality correlated with their outcomes. So this is the question, is operative management better than non-operative management? And there have actually been two randomized controlled trials to look at this, and interestingly, neither showed uh, very striking significant differences. In fact, this paper looking at 471 fractures followed from two to eight years found no appreciable difference in operative versus non-operative management. Uh, the other randomized controlled trial looking at 82 fractures with up to 12 years follow-up at one year, once again, no appreciable difference. But it's important when looking at the literature to look at how they analyze this data and what their outcome measures were. They use the VAS, the SF36, and the AOFAS, and these outcome measures have problems uh, when 
evaluating calcaneal fractures, specifically the SF36 is uh, non-responsive and the AOFAS is non-validated for calcaneous fractures. Uh, but when looking at this um, RCT, at the 8 to 12 year follow-up, they did find with the surgical group that there were lower rates of post-traumatic arthritis and some trends in improvement in the VAS scores and higher rates of complications with open surgery. And that brings us to our third technique, which is the mini open, which is thought by some to be a hybrid between uh, the two other techniques in that you get a better reduction than closed management, but it's less of a, an assault to the soft tissues. And uh, one paper looked at the uh, minimally invasive technique versus an extensile lateral approach, and they found more complications in secondary surgeries with the open approach no significant differences in the Bowler's angle or the angle of Gassain and similar clinical results. So with that context, I'll hand it over to Dr. Benerska, who will be talking about the extensile lateral approach. Good morning. Uh, I have to really always uh, begin a discussion of this topic with a a uh, recognition of two of my mentors. Uh, fortunately, uh, one of them is here in this room. Uh, Ted Hansen really was one of the ones that spurred Bruce and I to really explore this area. And the person on the left is Emilia Trinell, who actually visited us in 1985 and had an interest in calcaneal fractures and actually showed us uh, how he managed them at, at Harvard. And that's what spurred us on with our early uh, in investigation of this problem. The rationale for the open treatment of calcaneal fractures is essentially one to correct all the deformities that Tim alluded to, uh, to essentially reestablish the morphology of the bone, and that is the shortening, the articular incongruity, and in hopes that you would get optimal foot function. The tuberosity position of the foot is critical in that plantar pressure is, is pivotal in normal gait, with, whether it be running or walking, and that is essentially what initially is uh, hitting the ground or the floorboard in a car wreck. The current management scheme that we've done really based on, on Bruce's study on the understanding that even two millimeters of displacement will cause an irrevocable change in subtalar biomechanics, uh, significant various deformities, and essentially a significant loss of height, especially uh, in an injury where you're thinking about conservative treatment, but the height is significantly changed. And the question is, how do you measure that? Here's an example of an injury, a tongue-type lesion, where you see that there's marked depression of the articular surface, but you also see the plantar tuberosity of this heel has been imploded. And when you compare that to the normal side, that it actually accomplishes a significant change in the shape of the foot on this sagittal view. We learned early on that timing was critical, and if you wait long enough, even the more complex soft tissue envelopes will resolve, and this is just an example of a 70-year-old man who we ultimately treated, but you can see it took three weeks for him to resolve his soft tissue envelope. Open fractures has always been a, a bugaboo with, with respect to the management because the concern of infection, and since most of these injuries are immediately open wounds, uh, we've identified that perhaps there's a better way of managing than, the way, than when we originally uh, performed the surgery because we didn't really adequately reestablish the shape of the bone and tried to manage the medial wound just with uh, dressing changes. The, and you can see the substantial displacement of this particular injury. So we've essentially tried to avert some of the soft tissue problems on the medial side by realigning the foot. And this is just a, a rendition of how that would occur to, from the medial side, reestablish the shape of the foot uh, while you're waiting for the soft tissues to recover so that when you go later to do any kind of uh, treatment, you will have least, less uh, difficulties with the lateral soft tissues. This is just an example of that same patient where the soft tissue conditions improved, the lateral blistering uh, resolved, and he underwent an extensile approach later. We look at the 2D CT to ascertain for when you're doing open treatment, the size of the sustentacular fragment, the size of this area, where we're, where we're going to anchor our fixation. That's pivotal in terms of the management of this particular problem because you need something that you can anchor and compress to. And really when I was uh, given the charge of this uh, in 1985, I approached it uh, like another one of my mentors, who is Tom Rudy, who had with his mentor come up with an algorithm for the management of, of articular fractures. And that goes along with the principles that we mentioned earlier that is to do an anatomic reduction, in this case of the shape, to uh, provide rigid fixation to allow uh, 
um, early functional after treatment. And you see that most of these involved bone grafting defects because of the articular surface impactions that were present. And essentially, we evolved to an extensile approach that you can sort of see on this uh, artist tradition from Kate Sweeney that shows essentially all of the architecture on the lateral side of the foot can be managed by an extensile approach. And the one caveat is that there is an indirect reduction of the sustentacular component of this injury to the medial wall of the tuberosity. But that indirect reduction actually facilitates more rapid healing because you don't disturb the blood supply on the medial side. This involves essentially positioning the patient in the lateral position because we try to do this supine. It's quite uh, discouraging to try to do this in the supine position, so we've evolved to doing it in the lateral position. And we have special pillows and apparatus to essentially keep the patient comfortable, uh, including their upper arm, so that they essentially can lie on their side comfortably while the uh, surgery procedure is doing uh, on the lateral position. The extensile approach is essentially a J or an L, and it's based on uh, whether you're doing a right or a left heel. And you can see that essentially this is very different from what we initially had embarked on that Emil Trinell talked about. And this is essentially was the COCA approach, which was done prior to 1985. And you can see the blue line there. That was a surgical incision. And we did this because uh, Emil showed us that this is the way he was managing them. And unfortunately, we had the a discouraging view of a number of structures we didn't really want to see, the sural nerve and the perineal tendons, many of which would granulate in at the time of closure of the wounds because the soft tissue envelope was very precarious in this area. So we evolved to this sort of more extensile approach where you are doing a, an, a J or an L, where you're doing a periosteocutaneous elevate, elevation of all of the structures on the lateral side, including the perineal tendon sheath. And essentially, the order of reduction is once again, this sustentacular fragment anchoring the angle of Gisan, which is here, and the anterior process to the sustentaculum, and then working our way posteriorly to the posterior facet. Uh, this requires a headlight, and for, to, for us to see into the wound, to see the articular surface reduction, you need to be able to see into the void that you're uh, essentially looking into in the depths of the foot, and so this requires some sort of light to see in, because you cannot do this by indirect means. The, uh, the final thing after the articular surface has been reestablished, then the final path is, as mentioned before, the realignment of the tuberosity so its orientation is appropriately shifted so that you can get a better um, position of the heel on the floor. And this is just an example of an under-reduced where the medial wall has not been reduced yet, and with that same fracture, when it's translated appropriately, you reestablish the tuberosity position. We bone graft the defects in, uh, in the early 80s, uh, or 85 to 87. Uh, we used only autogenous bone, so everybody got an autogenous iliac crest bone graft. Uh, that's evolved to using largely allograft since 1988. Implant evolution has gotten better. We've gotten higher energy injuries, so we have to work on getting implants that are stronger, and uh, that's because the joint has to be supported for these more high energy injuries. And we're using lower profile implants that primarily are stiffer in this area so that they can control the forces of the talus as the patient walks and can maintain the position of the tuberosity. Uh, the lateral joint depression component of an injury that uh, is present is always uh, avascular, and this is an example of that lateral articular segment. Look from the lateral view, and this is the medial cancella surface. Uh, that is essentially what has to be fit in here, and this is an example of a true osteochondral autograft where the posterior facet has been anchored after the anterior process has been reduced. You see it keyed in here, but you can also, also identify that it has no blood supply. Uh, by essentially fixing the alignment of the foot and reducing the joint surfaces, you then have to provide medial to lateral compression, and that's afforded by the plate, so that when you actually compress this fracture, as Tom Rudy did with pilon fractures, we compress enough to restore the width of the heel that screws that you initially think are appropriately uh, of the right length are actually too long and have to be shortened. Here's just an example of a couple of cases. Here's a joint depression injury. You can see the cl classic lateralization of the heel with slight varus, the translation that you see compared to the, where the medial wall is, the articular surface depression. This is the, the fracture lines that Tim alluded to, the anterior to posterior medial fracture line, which is the primary fracture line. The secondary fracture line here, which has to be reassembled, and we would start with this fragment to the constant fragment, which is the sustentacular fragment, and then work our way back. So this is the intraoperative view of the articular surface restored with the tuberosity positioning, uh, not compression yet, and then this is now after 
the plate has been placed to compress the morphology. There are osseous defects that invite collapse, and you can imagine with some of the more dramatic injuries such as this one, this was an open injury. You see it took almost a month for him to heal to this point, but it's still not healed. This is prior to our use of the external fixator. And initially, uh, you can see that there's a daunting CT scan about how you're going to manage this, but essentially if you approach it the way we were uh, discussing earlier, this is the amount of bone, bone void that was missing. Uh, this was bone grafted actually around with just cancellous bone graft. That's at six weeks, and here he is at a year, and slight settling of his morphology, but a reasonable maintenance of the alignment of his foot. Uh, when you close the wound, you have to do a periosteocutaneous flap. Once again, the old burrow approach, which was here, had a very thin soft tissue envelope. Here you have a much more robust periosteocutaneous layer that you can use, and then all of these sutures are placed to essentially help you reestablish the flap position, which is now put on stretch because you've restored the shape of the heel. Uh, the closure of the skin should theoretically be with as little tension as possible because that's the one we're most concerned about getting early sealing of the wound. Uh, they're all splinted and they start range of motion when their incision is sealed and routinely we're, for the joint depression injuries or for the injuries that we do it with an extensile approach, they're not laboring for approximately 12 weeks. Uh, this is just an example of a patient that essentially we encourage them to move as much as they possibly can. This is a joint depression injury about six or seven weeks after her surgery and Essentially, we try to get her to do as much motion of her foot as she can while she's waiting to walk. And it's frustrating for these patients because they think they can walk because they, their foot doesn't hurt and their foot moves. Uh, the, the bad concerning problems that we have are uh, the smoker, the diabetic, and the non-compliant patients. We identified that in our study, and those patients still will come to you, and the question is how you're going to manage them. This is just an example of all three of those, and you can imagine if we left this alone, it would be a daunting reconstructive process. Uh, I elected to try to manage it, but was unable to manage this uh, without having some intermittent wound drainage here, which necessitated hard removal, but we were able to maintain the position of his foot, and that's a, an easier problem to deal with than trying to manage this conservatively and then a later procedure. So what is a surgical emergency? Well, we've talked about the open fracture. That's quite obvious. That needs initial management. But we also identified uh, a number of patients that have been sent to us with skin at risk, and that is where the cutaneous envelope, principally the posterior envelope, has been put at risk. The skin is essentially white here. If it's not managed acutely, it will become black because it's avascular, and that necessitates some immediate management, and this was written up by Mike Gardner, who uh, alluded to the importance of reduction of that displacement. This is what happens if you don't do that, and you can see this is a relatively elementary tongue variant injury, and you can see the, essentially the tuberosity is trying to erode its way through the skin. We have new injury patterns that really defy description. You can't even classify them. This is an example of what you see in a head-on collision on the freeway. This is a uh, right foot that was uh, broken by the impact, and the left foot was also broken, but this is just by way of an examination of the shape of the normal foot compared to the injured foot. We literally just tried to reestablish the morphology with this frame. Uh, the reconstruction here you see is acutely was done about three and a half weeks later. We saw him at a year and, and at seven years, and it's not perfect, but he manages to walk and he doesn't have any pain, so we've accomplished what we set out to do. We did look at the outcomes of extensile approaches, and we found that if you look closely at all of these patients, man, it's exactly the same with, this, with respect to the extensile approach, that we could get reasonable soft tissue management uh, success. There were some issues with wound healing difficulties. All those patients were managed only by hard removal, did not require any other sort of a management, such as a free tissue transfer. Uh, so in summary, really, there, there is a possibility of doing an anatomical reduction. Uh, the risk of infection is reasonably low. It's not zero or one percent. It's a bit more than that. But the idea of doing complete morphologic reconstruction makes sense. Uh, I have to say, I think it's worth the effort, given what, when you see the patients coming back compared to what I saw when I was in training, which was never seeing one of these treated. Um, in 85, once again, when we started doing this, uh, about 30% of the referrals to Dr. Hansen's foot reconstruction clinic were calcaneal um, post-traumatic reconstruction. That is, patients that were not treated, that were treated conservatively, and needed an operation of a varying types to try to get them to walk, but none of them were happy. Uh, in 2014, I would say nearly all of the fractures that we see at our institution are treated. Uh, 
most of these are extensile or the mini incision based on the, the particular aspects of the injury. Uh, all the reconstructions, which are fortunately relatively rare now, are done with this extensile approach. That being said, sadly, two days ago, this is a patient that came to my clinic. This is a 25-year-old man who had a fall off a of scaffolding at a construction site in Oregon. And he, as you can see here, he was never treated. Uh, he now is two years after his injury, and he's in a wheelchair, has not been able to walk. His spine was treated appropriately, but this is his uh, reconstruction uh, attempt that we're gonna try to have to manage, which will be, will be daunting. And finally, uh, a sobering future for the residents and the, those individuals that will be managing trauma. If you look at what is going to happen worldwide, if you look in 1990, the sequelae of road traffic accidents as measured by the DALI scale, which is the Disability Adjusted Life Year scale, it will go from number nine to number three by in the next six years. So it will be a significant problem that society has to contend with. Thanks, we're gonna go on now. Bruce is gonna talk about the mini incision approach. So uh, we'll go quickly. Uh, I have no commercial conflicts of interest to disclose. So we have only observational evidence to support open treatment and limited understanding of what patients mean. So Tim talked about the fact that we have two large prospective trials that have shown no difference in outcome between two groups, non-operative and operative. And yet both of those trials have shown that in the non-operative group, the incidence of post-traumatic arthritis is between four and six times as high. So what that tells us is that the study quality wasn't very good and the outcome measures used were not, were not responsive to the treatment plan that we were doing. Nonetheless, the data has gone from when Dr. Bernersch and I were taking our boards, it was a risk to have open treatment of a calcaneus fracture on your patient list because it was considered a little bit out there. And then just a couple years ago, I had to defend two doctors who chose to treat a patient non-operatively and were being sued for not doing surgery on a calcaneus fracture. So it just shows how public perception changes way out of line with the data that we have to drive decision making. So the literature does support the idea that open reduction provides better outcome for patients if you take out the ones that have no, no problems or complications with their soft tissues. Uh, small, so small decision of treatment makes a lot of sense. It's, it's defined as any variety of approaches that doesn't use the extensile approach as described by Dr. Bernerschka. It was initially used to describe tiny little incisions, but now it's been expanded to the point where people are now making those old Palmer or Coker incisions and calling them small incisions, just like we were back in the late 80s. So a small incision is good because it's the, the number one predictor of poor outcomes is stiffness, and you get stiffness from having a big flap, and you get stiffness from having a splint, and you get none of those things when you have a small incision approach. The biggest complication from treatment of calcaneus fractures is wound healing complications. And I know that Dr. Bernerschke just reported a 1.6% wound healing rate, but that is way different than most of the literature shows. And because even in our institution, small incision results in better outcomes. So this concept's been around for 15 years. This is one of Paul Tornetta's papers. I've actually been doing this for about 20 years, and I'll show you that patient here in a, in a moment. Uh, the possible treatment outcomes that, are, that you get from non-operative care are widened heel, horizontal talus, fibular impingement, perineal tendon subluxation, and stiffness, and all of those can be managed with a soft tissue, with a small incision technique. And you get soft tissue, compromised soft tissue, which is the key element for doing the small, small incision technique. So we've kind of covered why to do it. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll also go over when, who, and how very briefly. So why do we do it? Patients like the idea it reduces the number one cause of poor outcome. It shortens the length of stay and reduces cost significantly. And it, in our estimate, reduces healing time as well. So when do you do it? When implies two different questions. So what fracture pattern is good. We know that tongue type fracture patterns with posterior facet intact, that was our initial target group for small incision technique. Those with limited anterior process combination, those with soft tissues that are incompatible, those with conflicting injuries. So if you have a tibial plafond and a talus fracture, those are higher priority injuries and we don't want to take priority away from those higher injuries to make an extensile approach and patients whose outcome are known to be poor. In our own institution, we studied open treatment with extensile approach and showed that those who had a lot of anterior comminution had a poorer outcome than those who did not. So that group also fits in. So who should do it? The same people who do 
open treatment of calcaneus fractures. It is not that simple to do. You have to understand the fracture patterns. So you need a good 3D understanding of the fracture patterns. You need someone who has an, a, a C arm who knows how to get into position. And you have to have done a sufficient number of calcaneus fractures by the open technique to really understand what the parts are. So how is it done? It's done through small incisions, about a half, and, half a centimeter in length. Small elevators introduced to move the pieces around. Fracture, frangles, fracture fragments reduced with a Gassain spike or some other technique and performed under fluoroscopic guidance. There are no plates used, no bone grafts used. The CM is brought in from the end of the table. So here is the foot of the table. The patient's head would be up here and the CM can rotate up to get a lateral view as you see here or a Broden's view and it can flip down so that the transmitter is at the end of the table, or the transmitter is at one end and the receiver is at the other end, so you can get the axial view, so you can get a good view of the sustentaculum that Tim talked about, the posterior facet, the middle facet, and the medial wall. So this is a kind of typical fracture pattern with joint depression uh, with a tongue component, but with a very significantly depressed posterior facet. And you place the shans pin in, elevate it up, and then provide your fixation across the anterior facet, uh, across the fracture line. <laughs> and this is the index patient that I talked about from 1994. He had this fairly simple tongue-type fracture pattern sustained in a fall at work. He was a laborer, and I had very difficult time getting through to him to make him understand that he had to stop smoking. He wouldn't be able to walk on it. It was clear he was not going to be compliant with the post-operative management we were talking about. He had this combination of the anterior process, but wasn't dramatic. He had a largely intact posterior facet on the tongue fragment, and he had the pressure on the posterior skin that Dr. Bernerska just alluded to a moment ago. So he's treated with a Gassane spike. We brought the tongue piece up, so from the depressed position into a neutral position. This is the sustentacular screw. These other three screws are crossing the fracture line. This is the axial view showing an incomplete reduction. And I mentioned that this is the index patient. I chose this technique because I didn't think he would listen. He was one of those people who made the upper half of the class possible. His cognitive limitations were apparent in the discussion. And when he came back at two weeks to get his sutures out, I was sitting and taking his sutures out and I looked around the room and I saw that he had two shoes, no splint, and no crutches. And I said, where are your crutches? And he said, I think they're in my closet. And I said, your closet at home? And he said, yes. And I said, how'd you get here? He said, I took the bus. It turns out he had walked six blocks to the bus. He had gotten on the bus, taken it three blocks from the clinic, come to clinic. And I said, you know you're not supposed to be walking on this. He said, I didn't walk on it. I walked on my toes. So, of course, <laughs> he multiplied the lever arm dramatically to pull that tongue fragment back to where it was. We took him back to x-ray, and it had not displaced at all with just these five screws. So that was my index telling me that this technique had opportunity, that this guy could be full weight bearing in 13 days post-op without any destruction of his injury. And this just so I started doing a little bit more of them after that. So this is the technique. It can be applied to a variety of different constructs. The red line represents the Gassane spike. And uh, I'm sorry, that's not showing up very well. But the anterior process has to be put together first with this screw, and that allows you to get these other crossing screws across the primary fracture line. So it can be used in a variety of conditions. You can get a fairly good reduction of that medial wall. You get a, want to get a crossing screw into the sustentaculum tailly and you get that medial wall reduced back to normal. As you get a little more experience, this clearly would not be a fracture pattern that would be usually used for a limited approach, but this is a patient with a back injury, had a ruptured uh, uh, wrist fracture, he had bilateral calcaneus fracture. He was actually a medical student here who had broken both of his heels. He wanted to get something that would heal fast with lower extremity swelling. This is what he looked like pre-op, and this is what he looked like post-op almost reduced, not completely perfect, but his alignment, his contours, his height was restored and he healed quickly. These are what the incisions look like. So here, this is the incision from the same spike. The rest of these are for screws to go in and this one is where the AO elevator is introduced to elevate the front of the posterior facet. They can be used for joint depression injuries too. This is one of Bob Dunbar's patients that was, he was on call. 
pa brought this patient in, washed him out, got a nice fixator, got an excellent reduction just with the fixator, and this got most of the pieces back except for the fraction in the middle facet, which we were then able to elevate at the time of insertion of the screws and wires. This is a 78-year-old patient with a poor soft tissue envelope that was open medially. This is her after the operation. This is her at one year back to relatively normal function with pretty good uh, movement. We can also use it for those with a known poor prognosis. We know that these die punch injuries anteriorly, where you've taken a big chunk out of the front of the posterior facet and the half, back half of the middle facet, these do not do well with open treatment. They become stiff. Here's that die punch injury. You could see it getting starting at the front and moving back into a fairly comminuted extension into both the middle and the post, posterior facet. So in this example, the posterior facet is elevated. This tuberosity piece is pushed out of the way. The die punch is pushed up at the back end of a Penfield elevator, and that allows everything to line up along the posterior and the middle facet. And then screws cross that fracture line. You can see the same thing in the axial view with the reduction in a stepwise fashion. Here's the patient at the end of the operation with a near but not completely anatomic reduction. It can also be used in a tongue type with comminution. This does not fit into our initial fracture pattern either. It's almost a combined joint depression and tongue with a blowout or medial wall. And this is the uh, axial view showing that the joint was stepped off more than a centimeter. The anterior process is highly comminuted one that we know would not have a good outcome with the traditional approach. Here are the sagittal reconstructions, again showing the posterior facet quite depressed and comminution in the anterior process. And as you take the chance pin, introduce it into the tuber, bring that up, push up the front of the posterior facet until the posterior and the middle facets are anatomic, hold that in line, fix the anterior process, place screws across the primary fracture line, and here's the patient at the end with a nearly anatomic restoration and no incisions. Here's the axial view of that same patient showing that we have not completely reduced the medial wall, but we have the posterior facet and otherwise the alignment is good. Here's the patient at six weeks post-op and here's the patient fully restored, normal weight-bearing activities at 10 weeks. Uh, the combination on the medial wall has now healed. And finally, this is an elderly demented patient with bilateral calcaneus fractures that we would have loved to have treated closed, but he had skin at risk, and his family said the only thing he can do now that he's so demented is to walk. So we took these relatively comminuted injuries, uh, reduced, so here's the right side with a lot of anterior process combination, tuber involved, brought it up, reduced the posterior facet, reduced the tuber, held those with K-rise and cannulated screws. Here's the axial view of the same. You can see that the posterior facet is completely restored. And here's the left side that was even more comminuted, followed the same pathway to reconstruction, restored posterior middle facet, completely nearly anatomic. The patient, of course, began walking before we told him to, but he managed to heal in this position, and this is him when I saw him back in clinic with no pain and virtually normal motion. This Let's see, how can I get this to work? This is a video of a patient at three weeks that worked before, before we started here and didn't work when he transferred. So that's our, unfortunately, this is a patient who's three weeks out. You can see his incision. He's got nearly normal range of motion. So is there data to support this? We actually did a trial at our own place comparing isolated calcaneal fractures of a tongue type and briefly, the patients who had the small incision stayed in the hospital about a third of the time. They began unrestricted weight bearing in less than half the time. Their pain scale was lower throughout the entire course of the post-operative time. Their de complication rate was unchanged in the two groups. At six weeks, they had better outcome scores. At three months, they had better outcome scores. At six months, they had better outcome scores. And at 12 months, they had better outcome scores. So all along, less expensive, faster healing, better outcomes, and better motion. So these are reasons to do it. I'm not going to tell you that it's good for all calcaneus fractures, but it should certainly be part of the armamentarium. And uh, sometimes it doesn't go well. This is someone who came to one of our conferences, saw these x-rays, but had no experience doing calcaneus fractures. This is the result. I got it at six weeks with the screws not in the fracture, not reduced, and a much more difficult time restoring this back to something that, that the patient could walk on.
So it's not idiot proof. Most of the papers addressing small incision techniques have no comparative cohort. They've selected out the relatively easy patients to study, so the data isn't very good. But at least in our institution, we compared them with experienced surgeons, similar calcaneous fracture patterns, and showed that this technique works. But don't forget that a lot of calcaneous fractures can be treated non-operatively, and you have to keep this into mind when you're looking at these non-operative or these comparative studies of the small incision technique with the simple fracture patterns. These are the patients that don't need an operation at all, and they're not a worthy cohort for uh, comparative purposes. So this technique's worth knowing about. It has a lot of advantages, but it's not perfect. And thank you for your attention. Dr. Bernerska, if you'd join us, we'll just briefly review a couple of cases, and I'd like to have you guys take a look at uh, the injury films and talk about sort of your thoughts on management and things that you guys consider. So the first case is a 24-year-old gentleman was a high-speed motor vehicle collision, a closed left calcaneus fracture, otherwise healthy patient, doesn't smoke, uh, no real medical problems. So here's the injury uh, plane films. And then we'll just click through some uh, CT scans. These are sagittal shots, the coronals, and the axial. So uh, maybe Dr. San Jorzen, you could start by looking at the films and telling us what you think. Well, let's just go back. So we start with a lateral view because that gives us the measure of Bowler's angle that Tim alluded to. It's a fairly flat Bowler's angle. If you draw the line here and here, it's probably in that range of five to 10 degrees. It looks on the plain film like the posterior facet is largely an intact piece. The middle facet does not appear to be terribly displaced. You can see, however, that there's comminution extending into the anterior process, so there probably is more that you can't see. The medial wall is buckled. It's about a centimeter lateralized. That puts it on the border of whether it needs an operative approach or could be managed non-operatively. The CT scan supports that the posterior facet is in a large piece as you scroll through it. And the middle facet is posterior facet, middle facet, not too terribly badly displaced. The combination looks like it's more lateral. And on the coronal cuts, there's a pretty significant step off that probably isn't ideally treated by non-operative means. There's probably eight to nine millimeters of step off there. And it's laterally displaced so that there's going to be some impingement into the subfibular space. And I think Dr. Bernerska would or both agree that this probably should not be left non-operatively managed. Any comments on that? I think the main question is always, uh, and my feeling is morphologically, if you can restore the shape of the foot, and that in many of the tongue variant injuries, if the anterior process is not too common or has not been superiorly translated, uh, that you can essentially, when we do this over, it's a percutaneous manipulation of the tongue variant injury with a shans pin as well. The difference being that uh, when Bruce is doing it, he's manipulating that and then affixing it with uh, percutaneous screws. The whole rationale for open versus closed as a management is to establish some, as best you can the morphology of the foot and however you can execute that. And I think that was well illustrated by Bruce's talk. And you can just sort of see the difference with open treatment is essentially a management, primarily of more common to anterior process lesions, which unfortunately ends up being more common with the nature of motor vehicular collisions that we see today. This patient ended up uh, in Dr. St. Jordan's hands and got the minimally invasive technique. So Shan's been replaced. The a elevator is used to push upward on the front as the shan spin is used to rotate until this piece is down. You, have, you can see that this patient started out in a little bit cavus configuration, so you have to tuck this top of the tuber in and then place fixation across that fracture line, which is going in this angle. And the anterior process had to be secured so that this screw would have something to bite into. Medial wall is restored. And it's not perfect. The anterior process piece is still up a little bit, but the facets are pretty good. The height is normal. And at six weeks, it's largely healed. And at 10 weeks, back to normal. Our second case is a 51-year-old lady who fell off of a balcony as a closed right calcaneous fracture, a distal radius fracture, some rib fracture. She's hypertensive and has hypothyroid. 
Uh, she doesn't smoke, and she works as a manager at a Weyerhaeuser Lumber Company. Uh, Dr. Bernerska, maybe you could uh, scroll your way through these films and give us your thoughts. So this is uh, an example of a joint depression injury, and you can see the, the primary fracture line, which, uh, uh, as we talked about earlier, goes from anterolateral to posterior medial. That separated the posterior facet fragment, and here you see the transverse fracture line that goes into the middle facet, which is caused by this axial loading. The tuberosity has been driven somewhat superiorly. Uh, if you go to, uh, this is another view that kind of shows the, the most significant impaction is really at the tuberosity of posterior facet interval and not so much in the front. You see this area is relatively spared. Uh, the medial wall is shifted as you characteristically see with a bulge here related to the posterior facet being depressed. Uh, this is just a CT scan. Shows you that really it's the entire posterior facet that we articulate with is essentially with the talus. There is a blowout of the lateral wall, but the major articular surface is essentially one fragment. It's just, I think, a scrolling through that. And here you see that this depressed area, this is rotated down a, a slightly. You can see where the articular surface probably should originate and the tuberosity where it has to come down. So this is really her major deformity is actually in the back. Uh, I think here, going through that. Do you want to? Yeah, so would you, uh, what's your plan then for this patient? Would you take it to the operating room and, and do an open approach or any other I think uh, a lot of the, the discussion, as Dr. Hansen mentioned, is really based on an understanding of what the patient's uh, intent is for their foot. If they are really interested in, in activities that require a lot of uneven ground ambulation, we try to do anatomic reconstruction because it allows the subtalar joint to work as normally as possible. This patient would heal what's considered the treatment and would have essentially slight loss of height, slight difficulty with a wider foot because of the blowout, uh, but probably their subtalar function would be reasonable it's, and they don't have much of the impingement of the anterolateral fragment into the sinus tarsi, which you see on a lot of the more dramatic depressed injury. So in my hands, I would uh, counsel her about the two options. One would be early range of motion, not weight bearing versus open treatment because that's the only way that I can reestablish all that morphology and it's, it's a discussion with the patient that you have to have. And this patient actually was treated uh, non-operatively. These are her four-week follow-up uh, images. And finally, uh, eight-week shots. So you can see basically she was compliant because uh, if you look at the height, it really is not appreciably different from the original injury and most patients, uh, if they're treated conservatively, have a hard time doing that because they end up inadvertently putting their foot down and there essentially is insidious compression of the talus on the posture facet and that leads to more significant depression if you look at them later. But if they're able to be compliant, uh, then potentially this would heal relatively quickly. And then finally, one more case. It's a 54-year-old gentleman fell 30 feet, a closed right calcaneus fracture, otherwise healthy non-smoking patient. Uh, Dr. Sanjores, maybe you could uh, click through these and give us your thoughts. So it's uh, a, a modest reduction of Bowler's angle, actually not, it probably would fall within the normal range if you measured it. The posterior facet follows all the way into the anterior process. There's some comminution that it exits by the anterior facet and the tuberosity itself is up. I'm going to guess that we have some coronals coming here. So on the coronal view, there's some widening. It actually extrudes a little bit medially. There is no subfibular impingement and no lateral extrusion, so there's room for the perineal tendons. The patient has a morphologic abnormality of the talus. This is consistent with a flat foot habitus. And there's some degree of impingement here, but I think there's still enough room for the, uh, for the perineal tendon. So this is another one that might be managed closed, although it's unstable because the dense ligaments supporting the medial side are obviously disrupted. So you might argue to treat this open based on that instability on the medial side. And this patient was uh, treated open by Dr. Benerska, so sir, maybe if you could just click through some of your floral shots. You know, I think Bruce alluded to the biggest problem. If you go back, this is the biggest problem here. Uh, to establish a stability, remember we talked about the sustentacular fragment. This is what things have to anchor to, and essentially the posture of a set, although it's one large fragment, has been essentially translated laterally, and 
it's very difficult to get this reestablished unless you can compress the posterior facet to the sustentacular fragment, which is why this anterior process needs to be brought in. You can see it here, I think. This needs to be brought in to the sustentaculum, and that will afford the space for the re remainder of the posterior facet to be brought in. And that essentially is what the big deformity is, is in this realm here rather than the tuberosity. The one caveat is if you look here uh, on the axial projection, the varus of the tuberosity does not get better. It only gets worse over time. So you have to recognize that the tuberosity needs to be controlled. But really in this, in this injury, it's this component of the injury that needs to be compressed to the sustentaculum, and this is what we did. This just shows you the intraoperative realignment of this large portion of the posterior set to the sustentaculum, and then subsequently the uh, area of compression. So this is really a relatively unusual injury because it's discontinuous with the entire posterior facet, but if you don't compress it, the, there is going to be difficulties with translation. As Bruce mentioned, the medial side is essentially sublux medially, and so we reestablish the medial wall, and then uh, this is just showing the fixation and then the compression. And when you look at the, uh, the, the real key is on the lateral view. Now we the anterior process is brought down to that sustentacular fragment. Posterior facet is anchored also to that fragment, and then the tuberosity is brought out of varus mm -hmm. with that stiffness of the plate here at six weeks. Here you see the axial projection, so we're using the stiffness of the plate to control the tuberosity and uh, the clinical alignment at five months that uh, what you're trying to establish is that position of the heel when they strike the ground. Thank you. We've got a minute or two for questions, if anybody has any. Otherwise, thank you all for your attention. Good job. Nice job. Time to hear about the match. When do you hear about the match? Yesterday. Are you coming here? <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah.